before the passage of last year's legislation. I want to thank the Attorney General's Office for their work on this issue since last year's law went into effect. They have responded when companies have forwarded price gouging claims to them, sending letters to the contractors who have violated this statute. Their efforts are one of the reasons we have returned this year to enhance the law. We need to make sure that these companies are not gouging insurers because in times when you need a water restoration company or a tree trimmer, you don't have the luxury of necessarily getting multiple estimates. And I can attest to that from a personal example. A few years ago, we had a pipe that burst in our home and as the water's pouring out of the ceiling, my only thought is who is the first company that can come out here and start cleaning this up? I didn't consider calling multiple restoration companies to ask for their best price. I called the first one that came to my mind and said, how fast can you get out here? And I know that I'm not alone on this, which is why we need to ensure that these companies are acting in a fair manner. Let me show you a couple of examples of companies who actions and those like them are helping to drive your premiums up. In your packet is an example of a tree that has been blown down and is resting on this structure. Most standard insurance policies allow for $500 per tree for re debris removal, plus the cost to remove it from the insured structure. An insurance company received a bill from a tree service in southern Minnesota. It included the $500 debris removal cost and then almost $9,000 to remove this tree from the structure. The charge included a line for storm damage climber and emergency hazard removal. I asked another tree trimmer as a point of reference what a fair cost to them would be to remove this tree based on their experience. They so said they couldn't imagine charging more than $2,500 to remove it. And here's, here's an example from a water restoration company. A water line to a water softener broke, causing water to run into the finished basement of a home. The home was, pretty was a pretty standard dwelling, about 2,000 square feet in total, plus the basement. The water mitigation company charged $77,000 for the water mitigation in the basement, and that did not include any of the cost to repair the damage. It was about 20% of the total value of the home. Some of the high-level issues with that bill included, you know, uh, the mitigation company was charging for fans, dehumidifiers, and thermal air movers for 16 days when a typical dryout takes three to four days. The company billed for water extraction and demolition of, of water, usually associated with sewer or other contaminants. A pipe leading to a water softener is clean and should have been billed as such. They were charging more dehumidifiers and other equipment that was used that was uh, more than needed based on the square footage and standard industry guidelines. The competitive bid that they received from another local mitigation contractor was $37,500, almost $40,000 less. <clears throat> the mitigation contractor revised their bill and submitted it with a $10,000 reduction. We have examples of other tree trimmers charging uh, almost $70,000 to remove a single tree, charging $337 per hour. Um, and I think we can probably all agree that stump grinders, steer skid operators uh, are not taking home four hundred and fifty to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So as I said at the outset, this price gouging hurts consumers in the form of higher premiums. These few examples are only a snapshot of what insurers see frequently. So a common question that I get and Senator Friends had alluded to is how much is this going to save consumers on their premiums? And my response would be something along these lines. If insurers aren't paying out seventy five thousand dollars to remove a tree when someone else will do it for thirty five thousand that 40,000 is money that doesn't have to come from premium. And multiply that across how many times insurers are gouged and you start to see some real savings. We think the bill in front of you today helps address this by holding tree trimmers and restoration mitigation companies accountable. Thank you, Senator Friends, for your willingness to chief author the bill. And Mr. Chair, as always, I'm happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Cocking. Are there other members of the public that wish to testify on this bill? Other members of the committee that have questions or comments for the author or for Mr. Cocking? Senator Friends, thank you for your good work trying to hold down uh, premiums for Minnesotans. We know the property and casualty market is, is a rough one, Mr. Cocking. Absolutely. And uh, Minnesotans are crying out. So this is one small step we can do. Uh, Senator Friends, closing comments. Yeah, thank you again, Mr. Chair, and thank you members for hearing this. That is our hope to protect consumers. I just want to share with members uh, I'm more confident of our ability to deter bad conduct with a bill like this than I am of its direct impact on premiums. And you and I have talked, Mr. Chair, at length about the way um, claims relate to premiums. I'm hopeful that we'll see a reduction of premiums along the lines of the amount of bad conduct we deter. That has not always been the case in our consumer protection work. With that, Mr. Chair, uh, happy to uh, answer any further questions. 
I appreciate your time and members hope you'll consider supporting the bill as amended. Member Senator Friends moves that uh, Senate file 3909 as amended be uh, recommended to pass and be sent to the Senate floor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Your bill is on the way, Senator Friends. If you could come take the gavel. Thank you, members. Uh, we'll now move ahead on the agenda with Senate File 2003. Senator Klein, welcome to your own committee, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Thank you for hearing Senate File 2003. I have the A12 as an author's amendment. Senator Klein offers the A12 amendment. Senator Klein to the A12. Uh, so delete everything amendment, Mr. Uh, Chair, I will walk through it as we discuss the bill. All right, members, any questions regarding the A-12 amendment? Seeing none, members all in favor of adopting the A-12 amendment to Senate File 2003 say aye. 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 All opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Klein to the bill as amended. Mr. Chair and members, Senate File 2003 as amended by the A-12 is the ticket transparency bill, um, sometimes referred to as the Taylor Swift bill. Uh, the event that sort of precipitated this bill, not only in Minnesota but across the nation, was the flood of uh, people in Minnesota that were trying to get tickets to a singular event um, and often were outcompeted by bots or were surprised by unexpected fees at the end of their purchase process. Uh, but beyond just that experience of trying to get to a Taylor Swift concert, I think everybody in Minnesota has a story of trying to get a ticket online, uh, going through the process, and then finding out at the end that the price was considerably different from what they thought they got uh, when they first clicked on the seat. Um, I want to just give a few thanks. At the outset, we've worked extensively with advocates from virtually every stakeholder in this process. Uh, the ticket sale online platforms, the resale platforms, uh, the venues and the teams here in Minnesota. Everybody has offered constructive criticism. I've worked closely with the House author, Representative Moeller, and we feel we have an excellent bill. I think you'll hear that in testimony today. Uh, I also want to particularly call out the work of Olivia Severson, our new uh, counsel on this committee, who uh, has worked tirelessly on this bill. There were four major principles we wanted to respect and accomplish uh, with the passage of this bill. One is upfront pricing, which means that the price you see when you first float over a seat uh, on a purchasing platform is going to be the price that you'll be expected to pay when you check out. Uh, you won't be surprised at the end of the transaction by 40 more dollars in fees uh, while you're on the clock to make the purchase. We wanted to address bots, which are already addressed in federal law, but we wanted to specifically reference that using computer automated programs to outcompete Minnesotans for tickets is not allowed. Uh, we uh, addressed false or misleading websites that purport to be, say, from First Avenue or from the Minnesota Wild, but in fact are from another uh, perhaps malevolent uh, seller. And we wanted to eliminate speculative seating sales, uh, which is the process of uh, an online platform selling seats to an event which they don't actually hold in hand on the expectation that they will ultimately be able to obtain those seats. So we addressed all of those things uh, with the uh, stakeholders. Uh, to quote Taylor Swift in 1989, everybody here wanted something more, but we think we've come up with a good bill. Um, members, uh, with that, I have testifiers. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go through the testifier list. The first on our list is John Runigan. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Runigan. Runigan. Mr. Runigan, welcome to the Commerce Committee. Um, if you could please introduce yourself and then present your testimony. I'm assuming um, we're looking for testimony somewhere between two and five minutes. Absolutely. Thank um, you. My name is John Runigan. I go to M State in Fergus Falls. Uh, I am a student at M State in Fergus Falls, and I'm here to today discuss the significant burden imposed by junk fees on individuals like myself who are striving to pursue a better future against formidable financial odds. 
Growing up in rural Minnesota, college wasn't on my radar. Uh, but in 12th grade, Ms. Abrams suggested teaching might be a calling, sparking a new ambition for me. So I took a leap, applied to Minnesota State, and began a journey to break a cycle of poverty that has stricken my family. As a first-generation college student, financing my education was daunting. I was able to secure aid and scholarships for tuition, but expenses like textbooks and commuting back and forth added up quickly. Gratefully, my parents allowed me to stay at home while going to school, uh, and today I balance three jobs meticulously budgeting every dollar to make sure I can make ends meet. Junk fees exasperate this precarious financial situation. These sim seemingly inconsequential charges, which are tacked onto everything with little explanation and transparency, add up quickly and disproportionately affect individuals like myself who are already teetering on the brink of financial instability. For example, I saved up to take three of my friends to go see NF at the armory. Uh, uh, the tickets were about $220, but by the time I completed my purchase, the cost soared to nearly $400. The extra charge wasn't going to the artist or even to support the armory. It's a service fee tacked on by some wealthy corporation for a service I'm never going to see. This makes it impossible for cons customers to accurately compare prices because they're always tacked on to the end of the transaction. This, the legislation to end junk fees for online ticket buyers is a critical first step. Mr. Runningen, just excuse me for a minute. Sir, if you would mind taking a seat. Okay, thank you very much. Please continue. No problem. Uh, the legislation to end junk fees for online ticket buyers is a critical first step to addressing this injustice. So please pass Senate File 2003 and level the playing field, mandate transparent pricing so consumers can shop around and make the best decision about how to spend their hard-earned money. Fight for Minnesotans working families and ensure we are treated with dignity and respect. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Renningen. Next on our testifier list is Mike Dean, and then following Mr. Dean, Ted Dusing. Mr. Dean, welcome to the Commerce Committee. Please start by introducing yourself. We're looking for two to three minutes of testimony if that works. Thanks very much, fire away. Thank you, Senator Friends, members of the committee. My name is Mike Dean. I'm the Executive Director at North Star Prosperity. Uh, we seek to build an inclusive economy for all Minnesotans. Uh, before I begin my testimony, in full disclosure, I have to share that I am the Vice Chair of the Taylor Swift Fan Club here at the State Capitol. And so um, just keep that in mind as we go through the testimony. I want to thank the President of the, F the Taylor Swift Fan Club, Chair Klein here, uh, for bringing forward this critical legislation. <laughs> Sorry, I just outed you. <laughs> if you don't, if you don't mind. This critical legislation. Um, this is really uh, an important issue. Um, it's impacted me personally. Uh, next weekend, I'm gonna bring my 12-year-old daughter to the Women's Big Ten basketball tournament to see the Phenom uh, Iowa star, Caitlin Clark. Uh, my daughter's unwavering love for women's basketball began at just the age of four when I took her to a Lynx game. Since then, she's been captivated, uh, both as a spectator and as a player. Witnessing her dedication uh, to the sport has been immensely fulfilling as a father. Uh, why she learns to challenge herself, set goals, and overcome obstacles. When she expressed interest a few weeks ago to attend the Big Ten tournament, I just couldn't refuse. I promptly went online to purchase tickets at $75 each, thinking that she could even bring a friend along for that price. But I was not done. Right before I hit purchase, they added a facility fee of $112, a handling fee of $6.18, and a service fee of $87.92. So those $300 tickets rose to $506.10. Why are these prices shrouded in mystery? Why can't companies just simply disclose these fees up front? And how have they managed to evade this accountability for so long? Right now, ticketing vendors like Ticketmaster are permitted to levy these junk fees that don't correspond to any service or product. As consumers, we feel we have no choice but to pay up. This practice of price gouging has persisted for years, driving ticket prices far beyond the advertised rates. It's bad for Minnesotans, it's bad for small businesses. By mandating transparent pricing and requiring ticketing vendors to disclose all the fees up front, we can level the playing field and empower consumers to make informed decisions with their hard-earned money. And in pricing boosts, marking competitiveness makes comparison shopping easier for consumers and reduces the overall costs. Studies have shown that the junk fees and drip pricing not only complicate comparison shopping, but has also result in consumers paying significantly more for tickets, often up to 21% more than the advertised price. Let's champion fairness and empower consumers in Minnesota by mandating transparent pricing that price fixes um, 
that thereby promptly uh, promoting healthy competition and shielding consumers from the scourge of hidden fees. Together, we can ensure every Minnesotan has the opportunity to make informed decisions with their hard-earned money. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean, for your testimony. Next, uh, Todd Dusing, please come forward and testify. And following Mr. Dusing, we'll have Tyler St. Clair. Mr. Dusing, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. That's correct. Thank you. Um, welcome to the Commerce Committee. Please introduce yourself and offer your testimony again. We're hoping for two to three minutes. Thanks very much. Absolutely. I'm Todd Dusing, President and CEO of the nonprofit arts presenter and operator Hennepin Theater Trust. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony in support of this Minnesota bill aimed at protecting consumers from unfair practices by ticket resellers. This legislation represents a critical step forward in safeguarding the rights and interests of Minnesotans in the realm of ticket purchasing. By supporting SF2003, together we affirm and protect our belief in the intrinsic value of the arts and their power to elevate the human spirit, unite communities, and positively impact local economies. Ticket resellers often operating in a largely unregulated market have been known to engage in practices that harm consumers, including exorbitant markups, hidden fees, and deceptive advertising. These bad actors dupe the consumer by manipulating the online marketplace to represent themselves as the official ticket source or falsely represent that they have ownership of the most desirable tickets, when in fact they do not. These practices not only exploit unsuspecting customers, but also undermine the integrity of the attendee experience. By implementing measures to regulate ticket resellers and ensure transparency and fairness in ticket transactions, this bill seeks to level the playing field and empower consumers to make informed choices. It aims to curb predatory pricing practices and establish mechanisms for recourse in cases of fraud or misrepresentation. The nonprofit arts and entertainment presenter will no longer have to be beholden to remedy a bad actor's dishonesty in order to preserve its reputation and relationship with event goers. Furthermore, this legislation aligns with Minnesota's commitment to promoting consumer rights and fostering a marketplace that operates with integrity and accountability. It sends a clear message that the interest of consumers will not be overlooked or sacrificed in the pursuit of profit. Your leadership on this bill exemplifies your commitment to support nonprofit arts organizations like the Hennepin Theater Trust and our quest to deliverable, deliver memorable experiences to individuals and families across the state of Minnesota. I commend the legislators who have championed this bill and their dedication to standing up for consumers across our state. I'd particularly like to recognize the chair, Senator Matt Klein. His leadership underscores the importance of enacting meaningful, meaningful protections for all Minnesotas in all sectors of consumerism. I'd also like to recognize the bicameral partnership between the chair and Representative Kelly Mahler. Thank you for not only championing consumer protection, but for also being guardians of the goods that are important to our quality of life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dusing. Next up, uh, Tyler St. Clair. Following Mr. St. Clair, we'll hear from Howard Waltzman. Mr. St. Clair, welcome to the Commerce Committee. If you could start, oh, please, yes. by introducing yourself and then presenting your testimony. Oh, good. I managed to avoid the chair squeaking sound. It's an early win in this testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Klein, members of the committee. My name is Tyler St. Clair, and I am on the public policy team at Vivid Seats, a ticket resale marketplace which aims to connect fans with memory-making live events. I'm here today to testify in support with amendments for Senate File 2003, we very much appreciate the opportunity to provide our perspective on how best to protect ticket purchasers in Minnesota. Vivid Seats offers award-winning customer service. We have been routinely featured on Newsweek's list of best companies for customer service and ticketing. We accompany that service with the leading loyalty program in the industry that rewards every purchase. And since our loyalty program's inception, Minnesotans have earned hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of reward credits through Vivid Seats. Every ticket sold on Vivid Seats is backed by our 100% buyer guarantee. We support this guarantee with a 300-person call center in Texas, and we are also a proud partner of Major League Baseball, and beginning next year, a fan can buy a ticket on our app and then use our app to enter any MLB stadium. People buy tickets from us not only because of our excellent customer service, but also because many times tickets offered on our site are priced at less than face value. Last summer, the Sports Fans Coalition published a study 
that examined resale prices paid by fans over a five-year period on resale marketplaces and found that fans saved over $260 million on sports tickets by buying them on the resale market. We support the pro-consumer intent behind Senate Bill 2003 and appreciate the sponsor's interest in our industry. We look forward to continuing to work with him on this effort, and in particular, we have provided suggested edits to the bill to ensure that competition between live event marketplaces continues to thrive for the benefit of Minnesota consumers. Um, although there are several concepts in this bill that we support, including clear pricing disclosures and prohibitions on deceptive marketing practices, we are concerned that certain provisions in this bill may have an unintended anti-competitive <coughs> impact. However, we are very glad to see the author's amendment regarding the definition of a ticket, which we believe to be a pro-consumer addition that will benefit fans. Um, again, we are concerned with some vague language in the bill that could prohibit resale sites from describing tickets for resale and appear to prohibit the use of seating charts to direct fans to seats. Um, again, we hope to work with the sponsor to clarify this language and arrive at an outcome that will protect consumers and protect competition in Minnesota. Thank you very much for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. St. Clair. Members, of course, we're going to hold questions sure. until all the testifiers have had a chance to go. Um, thank you again, Mr. St. Clair. Uh, now we'll hear from Howard Waltzman, and next up will be Sean Oyesh. Mr. Waltzman. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Waltzman. If you could please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you very much. My name is Howard Waltzman. I'm a partner at the law firm of Mayor Brown, um, and I'm here on behalf of Live Nation Entertainment. Senate File 2003 includes several very important pro-consumer initiatives. First, requiring all-in pricing from the first time a ticket is displayed, um, as well as requiring that the price of the ticket remain from the first time it's displayed until it's purchased, uh, is, is very important and will provide the type of transparency that I believe this bill is intended to, to do. Second, this bill would ban speculative ticketing. If someone doesn't have a ticket, they shouldn't be allowed to deceive consumers into thinking that they do. Speculative ticketing leads to consumers paying exorbitant prices for tickets or losing out completely on getting to see their favorite artist or team. Third, this bill would ban the use of deceptive URLs. Consumers are often deceived into paying more for tickets than they should by thinking that they are shopping on websites affiliated with the venue, artists, or teams, when in reality, it's a reseller's website where the prices of the tickets are a lot higher. Fourth, this bill would include important reforms to uh, policing the conduct of bots, which crowd out um, consumers from being able to purchase tickets. There's one thing that we would like to see clarified. The definition of a ticket currently lacks the recognition that a ticket is a license granted by rights holders such as venues, artists, and teams. Tickets are the intellectual property of the content creators and the ticket in this bill should be defined in this manner. But this bill is a very positive step forward for consumers, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Waltzman. Um, next up, we have Sean Oyesh. And the final testifier on our list of expected testifiers will be Hope Ledford. Mr. Oyesh, welcome to the committee. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's close, Ayash. Ayash, but Mr. I Great Mr. effort. Thank you for helping us, Mr. Ayash. Welcome to the Commerce Committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing on Senate File 2003. My name is Sean Ayash, and I am the State Government Relations Manager at StubHub. StubHub is supportive of this bill with amendments. Um, we applaud the sponsor, Chair Klein, for his interest in our industry and intent to craft legislation that empowers Minnesota's consumers. We hope to continue to work with Chair Klein and have respectfully offered amendments aimed at fostering safe, transparent, and competitive ticket marketplace in Minnesota. What is StubHub? As some of you may know, StubHub revolutionized the ticket resale marketplace by taking ticket resale off the streets and bringing it online. As the world's leading ticket marketplace, we provide a platform that allows buyers and sellers to connect. We do not buy tickets for the purchase of resale. We do not set the price of tickets listed on our site. What we do is provide customer service in those transactions. 
and security through our Fan Protect guarantee. Put simply, we provide choice for consumers. StubHub supports public policies that empower consumers and ensure a safe, transparent, and competitive ticket marketplace. We believe a competitive marketplace provides consumers greater access to the events they want to experience and ability to purchase tickets at a fair and market-driven price. We support many of the concepts contained in SF 2003, including pricing disclosures, further prohibitions on the use of bots to purchase tickets, and prohibitions on the use of deceptive URLs to market tickets to consumers. There are, however, opportunities for enhancements. The current bill prohibits the sale of tickets prior to a public on sale. This provision is designed by places of entertainment to eliminate competition in the marketplace. Ticket holders frequently obtain the rights to tickets prior to any public on sale. While speculative ticket sales would already be prohibited under this statute, this provision further prohibits actual ticket holders from offering their tickets for resale prior to the public on sale process. If I own the tickets, shouldn't I have the choice to do with them what I please? StubHub also conceptually supports disclosing all necessary elements to ensure purchaser is getting what they need from a ticket. However, as written, we are concerned that SF 2003 would allow places of entertainment to retaliate against consumers who resell, donate, give, or give away tickets to events they can no longer attend. StubHub is a proud participant in the Minnesota economy. In the last 12 months, over 500,000 tickets have been purchased on StubHub to events in Minnesota. And over, the, over that period, we've brought folks from all 50 states to events in Minnesota. Thank you for the opportunity to share our perspective. We respectfully ask to continue to work with the sponsor and stakeholders on legislation that creates a more competitive marketplace and empowers Minnesota consumers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ayash. Um, members, we're gonna hear now from Hope Ledford. Ms. Ledford, if you could come forward, please. Welcome to the Commerce Committee. Please introduce yourself and present your testimony. Thank you, Senator, and thank you, Chair Klein. My name is Hope Ledford, and I serve as policy analyst for Chamber of Commerce, or Chamber of Progress, sorry, a tech industry coalition committed to ensuring all Americans benefit from technological innovation. Our corporate partners include companies like StubHub and Vivid Seats, but do not have a vote on or veto over our positions. We appreciate the amendments on this bill, but oppose SF 2003 as written, which would limit the ability of consumers to resell their tickets and benefit dominant ticket selling companies like Ticketmaster. We largely agree with the comments of consumer groups that have already spoken, but would like to add a few points. First, this bill prohibits speculative ticket sales, which could limit market innovation and consumer choice. The online resale market is especially beneficial for consumers unable to purchase tickets from original sellers, like Ticketmaster, within the time frame due to work or personal conflicts. This bill limits ticket holders from reselling their tickets before the primary ticket seller's public sale process, whether or not a ticket is speculative. Rather than an outright ban, we encourage the bill to require the disclosure of speculative ticket sales, which brings me to my second point. SF2003 also includes extensive language promoting disclosure. We support this goal and appreciate your attention to empowering consumers. We believe the best practice is to display the total price from the beginning to the end with an itemized breakdown available at the end of the process. Lastly, consumer rights include the freedom to enjoy and use purchase property as desired, including the right to sell it. We want to thank the chair and the committee for improving the language of the bill by defining ticket. This bill defines ticket, or sorry, a better approach is to protect a consumer's right to transfer or resell a ticket they have purchased. Six states have language guaranteeing this right. We appreciate the efforts of this bill as it's a step in the right direction. There are still improvements to make before we can support. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ledford. Um, that's the end of our scheduled testifiers. Are there any members of the public who did not request the opportunity to testify that would like to come forward now and testify to the bill before we go to member questions? All right, seeing none, uh, members, We'll go, um, any, any witness you want, uh, start with Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I don't know if I have a specific question, but maybe we'll see here. First of all, Senator Klein, um, don't expect to get a call of thank you from Taylor Swift. <laughs> um, I can tell you years ago, I carried the Hannah Montana bill and Miley Cyrus has still not called me to <laughs> express her appreciation. Uh, for my trying to make her tickets more accessible to her fans. Um, and uh, to Mr. Uh, uh, Dusing from the Hennepin Theater Trust, I saw a clue last night. I don't know if you're still here. 
It's fantastic. I recommend everyone who gets a chance go see Clue at the Orpheum. It's just, it's a laugh for the, all the way through. Um, that said, um, I'm a little curious about uh, the process here. Uh, the prohibition the sale of speculative tickets in particular seems to be a point of, of uh, concern. Um, and so, but there have been some other concerns raised too here. So maybe to uh, Senator Klein, um, what's the plan for the bill after here? Because there have been a few people who said we're looking forward to working with you. Um, is it expected this bill is going to go to the floor? Is it going to another committee? Um, are the questions that are being raised here ones that should be dealt with within the Commerce Committee process or after the Commerce Committee process? Um, I'll try that one, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Latz, for your question. It's just the intention of the committee to uh, recommend that this be passed and referred to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, so you'll be asking the... <laughs> hmm. <laughs> Senator Latz. Um, uh, well... As folks here know, I prefer that issues relating to a particular jurisdiction be worked out within that jurisdiction. Uh, so the Judiciary Committee in this case would not be sorting out commerce-related questions. Um, so uh, I'm not sure that I'd be entirely comfortable having a bill come over to us that hasn't addressed the commerce questions first. Uh, Senator so Latz, I, guess I'm asking the question. I assure you, you are being recognized today as a member of the Senate Commerce Committee, and so we'll do all the work necessary here. Um, Senator Klein, do you want to address that? Mr. Chair, Senator, Senator Latz, uh, and I appreciate that. We should do the Commerce work within the Commerce Committee. I can tell you, in response to the constructive uh, suggestions from several groups, uh, that we have been tireless and diligent, Rep. Moeller and I, in meeting with them, receiving their feedback, sorting through it, and then responding to those concerns. In some cases, the various parties here have conflicting interests in specific language. For example, the definition of a ticket should or should not include the word license. By the way, that is an area where I think juris your committee may have more significant jurisdiction. Um, but we listened to the competing uh, sides and we uh, made, I think, the right decision on behalf of Minnesotan consumers. Uh, in another case, the, the last testifier raised the concern that they didn't want to have to uh, display all the itemized list of fees throughout the entire purchasing process. We actually agreed with that concern and changed the language in the A12 so it's a hover phenomenon, so you can hover over it and see the itemized list. So that complaint has been answered. Uh, speculative sales, uh, I, what can I tell you? As, as author of the bill and as my uh, House counterpart author of the bill, uh, firmly maintain that that is a uh, malignant process uh, that needs to be banned. Selling a ticket that you don't have possession of uh, disrupts the market and fosters, candidly, the behavior of the bots that we're trying to get rid of in this process. So I, I feel satisfied that we've done the work of the Commerce Committee on this and I've, I'm comfortable handing it over to the Judiciary Committee where I think Taylor Swift would say, it'll either be forever or it's gonna go down in flames. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Klein. Uh, Senator Latz, any follow-up? Um, yes. Uh, thank you for the response, uh, Senator Klein. I, I appreciate that. And um, um, uh, I should have known how diligent that you were going to be in, in capturing all of these concerns. But a lot of the testifiers think they're still going to be changing things as this goes along. So my warning to the testifiers is don't come to the Judiciary Committee thinking that we're going to do follow-up Commerce Committee work. Um, this is your time here and now uh, to do that. And for future reference, if you're going to be making compromises, do them on Commerce Committee issues before the bill's heard in Commerce Committee, or you're not going to have another day, uh, at least not if it comes to judiciary. Um, uh, so if I understand this correctly, then just one technical question, kind of. Uh, one of the letters here refers to ticketing procurement services. Uh, which I can't tell if, if that's exactly the speculative ticketing uh, addresses the speculative ticketing prohibition that's in here or not. I mean, I can, I understand the risk to consumers involved in that, maybe paying up front to some kind of a technology company or a bot or whatever it is to hover out there looking for tickets in a certain price range or in a certain for a certain event and so on, and grabbing them electronically if I can't sit on my computer refreshing it constantly to do the same thing personally or if I'm not gonna be available when the tickets first come out. Um, so how does that all fit together? 
and uh, is there is that the best way to regulate ticket procurement services? I mean, I could pay someone in my family, I suppose, to follow up um, when they have a moment between events to see if there's anything available online, but be much more effective if there were another service I could pay a service fee to to reach out and try to find a ticket for me. Thank you, Senator Latt. Senator Klein. Yeah, we uh, heard uh, advocacy on both sides of that issue. Uh, there's a specific um, group that has a seat saver program where just as you say, if you're stuck in the Judiciary Committee and you uh, want to get tickets for something but you can't go you know, sit online and do it or you can't stand in a, a physical line and do it, uh, you hire somebody to do that job for you. Uh, and we respected and preserved that principle and that capacity in this bill. So I think that if that's your particular concern that is not prohibited by this bill. Senator Latz. Okay. Um, so a, a company could offer their service in finding a ticket they, know not, they do not yet have in their possession. Is that correct? They just can't sell the ticket itself that they do not yet have in their possession? Senator Klein. That's correct. Senator Latz. Okay. Thank you. you know, I, I will recall during a conference committee last year, Chair Moeller, at uh, precisely 10 a.m. on the morning of that conference committee, we paused everything. She went online. She bought the tickets to the concert she wanted to go see. We all cheered and went back to our work. Um, but she was kind of stuck in that moment. She had to be there for that. And I get it. I understand. Uh, some concerts are really popular. Thank you, Senator right. Latz. Thank you. Members, other questions for Senator Klein or the witnesses? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Klein. Um, I appreciate the discussion on this bill. One, as, as you're aware, there has been, especially at the national level, um, a lot of discussion around potential antitrust concerns within the ticketing industry, and you know, that isn't necessarily for a debate here today, but um, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces with the Department of Justice, Federal Trade Commission, that are, you know, have, have thought about these issues. And one um, concern I have in this bill is there's a, a couple places, and I'll talk about it specifically, where I worry that the legislation is effectively giving more market power to an individual player. Um, and there, there's two places in particular in the A12 amendment. Uh, if we look at starting at line 3.26 down to 3.30, um, the prohibition on uh, effectively pre-sell of tickets, except if they have permission from the place of entertainment. And so for me, that is a, a very core commerce issue where we're effectively giving more leverage to one player in the, in the ecosystem where they could permit or grant permission, but if you had a, a, a fan club that got access to earlier tickets that wanted to have a pre-sale opportunity or another market participant that they would be excluded or could be excluded by a single actor in the marketplace. Um, so I just would love to hear your response to that and, and if that's something that we're willing to address um, in this bill. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Senator Klein. Uh, thank you, Chair and Senator Rasmussen. This is an issue that we spent a lot of time thinking about. Uh, and I guess I'll just name the, the, the industry that we're speaking of specifically. Um, there's a, a dual relationship. There's an ownership relationship between Live Nation and Ticketmaster where they operate both as an operator under our terms of definition and as a ticket reseller. Uh, and in our original language, the section that you describe um, we had without first obtaining permission from the operator. Uh, and that would have been problematic on behalf of that particular business because they would easily obtain permission from themselves. Uh, so we changed that to the place of entertainment to address the very concern that you have. So now they have to obtain permission from First Avenue or from the Excel Energy Center uh, to do uh, these sort of pre-sale items. And I think it avoids the monopolistic concerns that you're concerned about. Thank you, Senator Klein. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Klein. I guess my concern is still, um, you know, if you had an artist that perhaps wanted to offer for pre-sale to a fan club, or you had another entity that wanted to offer pre-sale, now they have to go to a specific entity to get their permission that may or may not have a contract with the operators or other things that could prohibit them from doing something like that unless it was through their platform 
perhaps that operator is the one who can get exclusive permission from the venue to offer the pre-sale. And so I just have concern that we're giving uh, uh, something of commercial value within this ecosystem uh, very explicitly. And then the other place where I see this coming up is on uh, 4.21 and 4.22, where we talk about um, the, the opportunity to uh, you know, resell tickets and about how the operator, the online ticket marketplace or ticket reseller, um, you know, one of the options is for them to have a written contract with the place of entertainment to obtain the ticket. And, and I would be concerned there that certain operators might be able to get those contracts and to have a preferred relationship, and that could potentially box other resellers or uh, online ticket marketplaces from participating in those transactions. And so I've, I'm just concerned that in those two places, we specifically call out the, the place of entertainment can grant permission to other market participants to have privileges that other, other market participants can't. And so I just worry that are we perhaps putting the thumb on the scale for one market uh, player in this uh, conversation. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Senator Klein, do you want to comment? No comment. All right, thank you. Members, Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, I highlighted, I think, um, almost the same uh, portions of the bill that Senator Rasmussen talked about, so I won't rehash some of that. I do want to start off by saying there are some aspects of the bill I, I think are good. Some of the disclosure stuff, some of the prohibitions uh, I think are great. Um, I have a question as it relates to these two words, and they're found in the bill in a couple of spots, but the first one is line 3.28, um, and it's the term constructive possession. It talks about uh, whether one of these entities or a person having actual or constructive possession of such a ticket. I'm just curious uh, what is meant by or could you describe what, what the law intends as it relates to constructive possession? Thanks, Senator Duckworth. Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth, you know, I might actually ask if uh, Senate Council has an opinion on that. I, I uh, hadn't looked at that language very closely. Uh, I. I think maybe just the word actual possession would probably be sufficient. Constructive may describe a different phenomenon, but I wonder if council has an opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Severson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, I believe the thought process behind that was if we had someone who held um, like season tickets, so they don't maybe don't actually have the physical actual possession, but they know they're going to have them in, you know, for the next several years. So um, I th believe that was the thought process behind that. Thank you, Ms. Severson. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, and uh, I can appreciate appreciate that maybe being an example um, of what that might mean or, or what have you. I, I see it as a, it, it's a, a portion of the law that when I read it uh, leaves, I guess, a little bit of uh, vagueness or ambiguity in my mind as to what that actually means and how it might apply. It's not a criticism of your bill, but just a, a reality of when I read it. Okay, what, do, what does that actually mean? And how do we expect a layperson out there to, to know what the law may or may not allow them to do? Which leads me kind of to a, another portion of the bill. Um, on page four, lines 4.7 through 4.17, the things a person must not, um, and specifically lines 4.11 through four, lines 4.13. And I just ask myself, you know, how does that apply to somebody who's trying to, to buy, you know, some tickets on behalf of a friend or a relative? And it sounds like maybe some of that was discussed earlier. I had to step out. And I don't need you to answer the, the question right now, uh, Senator Klein, but that's when I look at the practicality of the law and how it will be implemented and how it might actually impact realistic situations where, uh, let's say, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my mom as an example. Let's say she's on a flight and she doesn't have the access or ability to go in and buy tickets, and she has asked me to do it on her behalf. Well, am I now violating the law, and am I gonna get in trouble? Did I disguise uh, my identity as uh, Mama Duck, you know, to go ahead and buy some tickets, or no? Uh, and I think that's some of the realistic scenarios people are gonna find themselves in, and did I violate the law or not? And last but not least, um, uh, constructive possession is again uh, uh, mentioned uh, online 4.19, but just above that talks about ticket reseller and they can't sell a ticket. And the way I read the bill is that really applies to anybody. Um, and so I just want to make sure that th that we know what the full scope of the law is and how it's going to apply to the very realistic scenarios of somebody, um, you know, just wanting to resell a ticket because they can't make it to the wild game anymore uh, and or 
their buddy or friend asks them to buy them on their behalf so that they can get the best price, which is, I think, what we're trying to do or accomplish. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Senator Klein, we're going to go to Senator Howe for the next question, unless you want to comment. All right. Seeing that, Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Klein, I, I appreciate the bill. Uh, but I'm going to go back to my other chamber days when, uh, especially when we were in conference committees, which we don't have very often here for some reason, but uh, some of us wouldn't have anything to do for a while, and hey, there's a Twins game going on, and we would just hop on and head over there, and we would pick up a, a couple of tickets. The game has started. You got some scalpers. They've got tickets out there. You buy them for a third of the cost, and in the game we go. Is when I see this reselling and, and does that mean that's not going to be able to happen anymore? Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, as I understand the bill, uh, your trip to the Twins is safe. Uh, that's not prohibited by the bill. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, so standing in line and buying a whole batch of tickets and then standing on the corner and reselling them? is not prohibited by, the, by this bill, because it certainly looks like it is. If I buy somebody else's, if I buy a ticket, uh, employ someone else to directly or indirectly wait in line, uh, I, I just, how does that not fall into that section of the law? Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, can you point me to the precise part of it, the bill that you're looking at? Sorry, yeah, yes, 3.18 and to 3.20. Okay, so the, the limitation on employing a person indirectly or directly to wait in line is only prohibited if the place of entertainment has prohibited it and posted that. So if uh, Target Field wants to say, we don't allow that practice to occur here, then you're out of luck. Um, but otherwise, I, I don't think they have a policy like that in place and you're going to be fine. Senator Howe, any follow-up? Uh, just, I guess I'm, I'm concerned that... Uh, they could do that, and then actually everything would have to go through StubHub, and somebody couldn't actually, I suppose, speculate on the on the, the Yankees game or whatever, buy a bunch of tickets, and then stand out there and actually try to get more than face value. Uh, and while that might not set well with a lot of people, but I think that's a, kind of the American way to take your risk and make a dollar and, or not make a dollar. So. Uh, uh, I guess that's my concern. I, I still think it's it's concerning, and I'll have you know that I haven't had that opportunity since I came over to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Howe. We're going to go back to Senator Rasmussen. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for an indulging one one last follow-up question. And, and I uh, wanted to speak as Senator Howe pointed out another place in the bill where we are effectively giving power to the place of entertainment um, to be able to determine other commercial terms. And one of, the, one of the concerns I have is if we look at uh, some of the, the largest ticket retailers, they oftentimes or can have ownership stakes in the venues themselves. And so I, my question, Mr. Chair, for Senator Klein is, are, are you concerned that you know, in the uh, few places we've discussed today where we're giving this power to the place of entertainment, that we could perhaps be making this uh, this issue worse by empowering some of the large incumbent ticket retailers to box out their competition using language in this bill. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen, I, it's a thoughtful uh, proposition. I will tell you I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it. If you could provide me with specific examples where an online marketplace had an ownership interest in a place of entertainment in the state of Minnesota, that would be helpful. Uh, if it is an issue that I have sort of neglected in the creation of this bill, I'd be glad to hear your thoughts going forward, um, but I do not hold your concern at this time. Thank you, Senator Klein. Senator Rasmussen, any follow-up, or do you want to cite any examples for the members of online ownership of venue or anything else that addresses that question? To Senator Latz's point, we're trying to address the commerce issues here, uh, and the motion will be to send it to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Any follow-up, Senator Rasmussen? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and th thank you, Senator Klein. And I, I know Live Nation Ticketmaster will sometimes have ownership stakes in venues. I don't know specifically in Minnesota what their portfolio would be, 
Um, but the, the concern would be, are we uh, picking specific market incumbents and giving them more power with the language in this bill? But I'm happy to continue to have that conversation with you. I just want to make sure we're not um, you know, picking a winner in this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Rasmussen. Members, any other questions before we go to the author for closing comments? Again, the intention is to send it to Senate Judiciary. Any closing comments, Senator Klein? I do, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you so much for hearing the bill. It's been fun to work on it. It's been a pleasure uh, to work with the many advocates um, here in the room. Uh, I'm thrilled to pass this on to the Judiciary Committee. There are no sort of uh, bad actors in this room, but uh, if there were, we can make the bad guys good for more than a weekend here. And uh, thank you for hearing the bill. Thank you, Senator Klein. Members, uh, Senator Seeberger moves that we send Senate file 2003 uh, as amended to be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Uh, the recommendation is passed in Senate file 2003 as amended will be sent to Senate Judiciary Committee. Thank you. Members, Senator Gustafson could come to the table. Welcome to the committee, Senator Gustafson. Senate file 3530 is in front of the committee. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, before you is Bill, Senate File 3530, which prohibits the possession, sale, or manufacturing of all cell phone cases that look like firearms. A quick internet search of cell phone cases will show how realistic these phone cases are to handguns. Um, I believe there is a handout there uh, that is being distributed to all of you. Our public safety officers have to make fast decisions, and it isn't safe for anyone to have cell phone cases that resemble firearms. Furthermore, if you remove the phone from the case, you provide a very realistic looking prop that can present several dangerous scenarios. These cases are not real firearms. Prohibiting them has nothing to do with Second Amendment rights. Um, I would also like to recognize Senator Latz, um, who presented this bill in 2016. And when he first brought the bill, he said, quote, someday some kid is going to hold up a cell phone case and somebody could die. On a related note, this, pa this bill did pass the Senate in 2016, uh, 60 to 0. So we hope um, that it, it, it's a small bill. We hope you will consider it. We do have one testifier, Mr. Chair, whenever you're ready. Uh, please proceed. Uh, Mr. John Swenson, please come to the table. Welcome to the committee, Officer Swenson. If you could introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is John Swenson. I'm the Public Safety Director, Chief of Police for the City of Lionel Lakes in Anoka County. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 3530. And I would like to thank uh, Senator Gustafson for her work on this legislation. Uh, I have had the honor and privilege of serving as a police officer for 35 years in the communities of Minneapolis, White Bear Lake, Lionel Lakes, and as an MP in the U.S. Army. It is my sincere belief that this legislation will make our communities safer by ensuring that items made to look like firearms are removed from our communities. There is no reasonable or responsible need to have a cell phone case look like a firearm. The use of items made to look like or fashioned as a firearm have led to tragic outcomes throughout our nation. And Senate File 3530 is one step in reducing these tragedy, tragedies from occurring in the future. I ask that you support Senate File 3530. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Swenson. Members, do we have questions or comments for the author or the witness? Senator Letts. 
Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to know if Senator Gustafson will allow me to co-author the bill with her. <laughs> Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Of course, I'd be honored. Any other questions or comments? Any closing comments, Senator Gustafson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I, I uh, appreciate the committee's support on this, and we look forward to another unanimous vote. Thank you. Apologies. Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just have a, qu a, a quick question as far as the definition of what it looks like, because I, I see the, the pictures. I actually called it up on my phone here, and I agree with you, anything that looks like one, but how about, and I'm just going to ask the question because I see them here on, online, a cell phone case that has a picture of a gun on it. It's tiny, but that's what I'm asking. Is it banned those or just the, the ones that actually have a handle and look like a gun? Senator Gustafson. Mr. Chair, thank you. Senator Howe, thank you. Um, no, so a cell phone case is just, a, I wish I had my cell phone with me, but a regular cell phone case that had a picture of a gun, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about literally the ones that in a, you know, in a, in a scenario where somebody had it in their pocket and it looks like a handgun, those present a public safety risk. And I agree. I just wanted to make sure that the intent was, was there. Thank you. Senator Howe. Senator Gustafson, uh, thank you for the bill. Uh, the motion is Senator Seeberger's that Senate file 3530 be recommended to pass and be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? You're on your way, Senator Gustafson. Senator thank McEwen. Welcome to the committee, Senator McEwen. We have Senate File 3678 in front of us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much for hearing this bill as well. Senate File 3678 was brought to my office from Representative Liz Olson, um, who is my, one of my House counterparts from Duluth. Um, she had been approached by one of our constituents uh, some years back about an experience that his family had had when they went to the Texas Roadhouse restaurant in Duluth, Minnesota. And I believe that in your packets there should be a letter from that constituent. His name is Andrew Olson. He wrote a letter uh, detailing the experience that his family had at Texas Roadhouse with this technology called Zeosk. Uh, I know that probably many of us have had this experience with this type of technology. They have it in some restaurants nowadays. You can sometimes order food from these. You can play games on them. It's almost like having a little iPad um, at your table where you can interact with it. So this constituent brought his uh, family to Texas Roadhouse and the waitress encouraged them to go ahead and use this Ziosk equipment and his son was playing around with it and then, then at the end of the meal he noticed that there was an extra charge. It was $1.99 which is not a large charge but there wasn't, he didn't know what it was for and he asked the waitress uh, what was this charge for and she said oh well that, that's the charge from the Ziosk. That's uh, uh, this small charge and so he, he the, the family had to experience this whole uncomfortable moment where the, the little boy who had played with this uh, felt bad because he didn't mean to spend any money and he didn't really realize what he was doing when he was just playing with this game. So, like a good constituent, this uh, gentleman brought this issue to his legislator and said, this seems, I know it seems small, but in aggregate, this is actually a really big deal. And when he looked into it, he found out that this company actually was marketing itself. Um, you can see in the back of the letter toward the end, um, their marketing says, let Ziosk be your ultimate revenue booster with on-screen promotions, engaging content, and fun games that not only entertain guests, but also drive incremental dollars. So what he felt was happening here is a sort of systemic way to put these small charges on customers bills without really their consent, without their knowledge, without them really knowing what they were doing. And so he, he thought you know, to avoid these situations for people, it would be nice if the disclaimer, that the disclosure about this was a little bit larger, clearer, so that 
uh, this wouldn't happen to uh, unwary uh, customers or small children without their parents' consent. So we submit this uh, uh, for your consideration and uh, would very much appreciate your support in just making sure that people know what they're getting into. Thanks. Thank you, Senator McEwen. And I see we don't have any testifiers. Um, and I also appreciate that the, the language of the bill simply requires a disclosure. It doesn't sort of prohibit this practice or Correct. create hard stops before it's used, just sort of the disclosure. And I think that's the way to handle this. Any member questions or comments, Senator Howe? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator McEwen. Uh, so this doesn't prohibit uh, someone under the age of 18 to use it, but it requires someone under the age, someone over the age of 18 to actually activate the payment or agree to do it. Correct. Well, it asks, th oh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Yes, I apologize, Senator McEwen. No. And thank you, Senator, for the question. So it, the this it requires a disclosure on the format that would require a, an affirmative affirmation that the person who is going to engage with this is 18 or older, and that it also includes a requirement that the font be large enough to just read the disclosure. So an affirmation of age of 18 or older, but a parent could, it, a parent could affirm that too. It's just providing those extra checks in there. Senator Howe. I, I just want to make sure that I can get it geared up and give it to my grandkid and let him play. That's what <laughs> yes. I want to make sure I can do. Yes, Dockworth. indeed. I've got to keep that grandkid busy. Um, I apologize if I missed this, Mr. Chair, but I'm just looking at my packet. Is there an author's amendment we're supposed to? No, okay, I apologize. That's all I wanted to bring to our attention. Other member questions or comments? All right, Senator McEwen. Uh, the motion is by Senator Wickland that Senate File 3678 be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate floor. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? On the way to the Senate floor. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I neglected to say I should have said I don't know that if this affects the procedure for this committee, but I was uh, notified by Representative Olson that she was going to have an amendment that dealt with enforcement uh, she was working with the attorney general's office to see if how, what that might look like. And so um, and in the House, at least, they had tabled uh, or, or held the, the bill while she worked on that, and then she intended to bring that amendment um, and then have it go to the floor. So I could also amend the bill on the floor uh, with the, the appropriate amendment at the appropriate time, whichever the, however the committee would choose to proceed. I know, Mr. Chair, you know much more about this type of procedure than I do, so I would defer to you. All right, we'll, we'll work on that going forward. Thank you, Senator McEwen. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Uh, Senator Gustafson. Welcome back to the committee, Senator Gustafson. Thank you for being flexible to accommodate uh, Senator McEwen. Uh, we have Senate file 3932 in front of us, and you have an A1 author's amendment, uh, which is offered by Senator Latz. Uh, all in favor of the A1, say aye. 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 Opposed? The bill is in the shape uh, that you want it. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee, uh, committee members. I'm here today to present SF3932. This is a bill that protects Minnesotans from lending, harmful lending practices, and supports Minnesota businesses by making out-of-state lenders comply with the same lending regulations that are required for Minnesota lenders. This bill fixes a problem caused by the Depository Institutions Deregulation and Monetary Control Act of 1980, DICNICA for short. 
although that's not much easier to say. Uh, it extended the state chartered banks that the right to support or right to export the interest rates of their location headquarters to other states. So when DITBICA uh, was passed into law in the 1980s, um, it's safe to say that those lawmakers did not foresee that a rent-to-bank scheme that we see today. A rent-to-bank arrangement allows online lenders to exceed state limits on loans used to finance the purchase of everything from car repairs to boats. Rent-to-bank schemes are created when a high-cost lender arranges for a bank to put their name on a loan to avoid state lending law. Just last session, we passed a bill to cap rates on payday loans to protect Minnesotans from predatory lending. By exploiting the the DITMICA rate export provisions, uh, rent to bank lenders continue their business um, in Minnesota despite the good work we did last session. So exporting higher rates through the rent to bank scheme favors out of state banks over local Minnesota lenders who must comply with Minnesota lending law. The bill exercises Minnesota's right afforded by Congress to opt out uh, the rate expor exportation provision preventing out-of-state lenders from evading Minnesota's lending laws. Iowa and Puerto Rico opted out of this in the 1980s. Colorado opted out last year in response to predatory internet lending. There is no evidence that states have opted out, have been subject to reduced credit access or increased lending costs. SF3932 requires that out-of-state banks lend at rates permitted under Minnesota law putting them on equal footing with financial institutions in Minnesota. This bill finishes the work of protecting Minnesotans by closing a loophole that allows non-Minnesota banks to import much higher rates than what is allowed by Minnesota state chartered banks. Thank you, Senator Gustafson. We have eight scheduled testifiers. I'm going to speed things up by having you come up two at a time. I'm going to ask you to try to limit your testimony to two minutes or less, and please don't repeat testimony that's already been provided by previous testifiers. We will start with Ann Leland and Christine Westbrook. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Chair Klein, members of the committee, uh, my name is Ann Leland. I serve as the executive director of a statewide nonprofit called Exodus Lending. We work with financially excluded Minnesotans to get them out of debt traps by refinancing high cost loans, defined as anything over 36%. Since we opened our doors, we've reached more than 700 Minnesotans across 46 counties and saved near the community nearly 2.2 million in fees that, or in interest in fees that otherwise would have been stripped from our communities. In 2023 alone, we refinanced 41 of these rent-a-bank loans that carried average interest rates of 188%. Let me be clear, these are not short-term nor small-dollar loans. These are longer-term, higher-cost installment loans that are bigger, deeper, and a harder-to-escape debt trap than the short-term payday loans we addressed last legislative session. No Minnesotans should have to pay $6,000 for a $3,000 loan. That's an APR of 160% over 13 months. When our state interest rate on such a loan would be 21.75 if we opted in, to dim, opted out of Dimnica. Put simply, evasion of Minnesota state usury laws by nefarious online actors who are renting a bank partnership with state charter banks outside of Minnesota should not be allowed. We are here to level the playing field to support our own strong network of Minnesota banks, credit unions, and community development nonprofit lenders in providing credits to all Minnesotans. Beyond the numbers and our work are the stories of hardworking Minnesotans who are getting stuck in these online installment loan, rent-to-bank loans. I'm honored to be joined by Christine Westbrook, a responsible Minnesota borrower who took out a loan from OpFi that quickly became unmanageable due to a 200% APR. She is here to, tell, to share her story today. Thank Welcome you. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Westbrook. I appreciate your testimony. Please introduce yourself and proceed. <clears throat> Chair Kleins and members of the committee, my name is Christine Westbrook. I am a single parent of five kids and I live in Hastings, Minnesota. In 2019, I was going through some financial hardship and a colleague suggested I take out a loan through OpFi. I Googled it and I was drawn in to the promise of quick help. I could get the money today. <laughs> I clicked through and got approved for a $1,300 loan and started making my biweekly payments directly from my bank account. 
Then when COVID hit, I lost my job, and it became impossible to keep up with the high payments twice a month, most of which was going to interest. My repayments were about $172 every two weeks. <clears throat> when I started meeting with the financial counselor at Neighborhood Development Alliance to address some debt in order to pursue home ownership, she was able to connect me with Exodus Lending. Exodus Lending was able to refinance my loan with OpFi, and it was a light at the end of the tunnel, and now I pay an, an affordable monthly payment. At that time, I took out the OpFi loan. I was going through a hard time financially and did the best I could. But it seems unethical to change to charge someone so much interest on top of the loan principal. It's just so unaffordable. Thank God I was able to find Exodus Lending. Now I'm in a much better place financially. Thank you guys for listening to me. Thank you both. And as you clear the table, could we please have Deputy Attorney General Whitney and Ms. Miller come to the table? Welcome to the committee, Attorney General. Could you introduce yourself for the record and proceed? Sure. Chair, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. My name is Jessica Whitney. I am the Deputy Attorney General over the Consumer Protection Section here with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office. I've been with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office for a year now, but prior to that, I spent 18 and a half years in Iowa, where I was the Administrator of the Iowa Consumer Credit Code along with the Director of the Consumer Protection Division down there. So I'm here today to speak in two facets. One, what we're seeing in Minnesota, and to talk about Minnesota interest law to the extent you have questions. And two, to tell you about my experience with Iowa in operating under the Didmica opt-out for over 18 and a half years and what I've seen in Iowa up till last year, 2023. So in Minnesota, we're still getting triple digit interest rate complaints, even though last session we passed excellent measures to try and stop, stop these high interest loans. Unfortunately, this loophole allows state banks to export their unlimited interest rate into Minnesota and still lend to Minnesotans. Um, Minnesota state banks are capped at 21%, but regulated lenders in Minnesota for small dollar loans are able to lend up to 50%, and loans above 1250 are a blended rate of 33%. That's the table that the legislature decided to set, um, but again, it's being circumvented by the Didmica opt-out. So Iowa, Iowa did opt out of Didmica. There were about six or seven states that did at the time. Iowa operated for over 40 years under this opt-out. I can tell you it did not create a credit desert in Iowa. We had robust credit. Colorado, who chose to opt out in 2023, did a study or helped commission a study on what it looked like for states who had interest rate limits. They didn't specifically look out the opt out, but they were looking at interest rate studies. And what they found was states with interest rate limits, yes, cr credit was slightly less accessible, but the borrowers were much in much, much better shape. Uh, borrowers were less likely to incur large late fees. They were less likely to be in what we would call financial distress that were caused by, by repetitive high interest loans, which seemed to at first blush be a life preserver, but are actually a concrete life preserver in that they drown the person in further debt. In Iowa, when these companies tried to come in, I was able to quickly uh, contact their opposing counsel or their counsel and get Iowa's money refunded and all the illegal interest refunded once they saw that we were opted out of Iowa. And then the company usually, the company, if it was less than triple digit interest, the company actually usually got a regulated lending license in Iowa and continued to lend in Iowa just at our rates and with an Iowa regulated lending license. I only saw good things for Iowa with the Didmica opt-out. It, it, it had bipartisan support throughout the 43 years. Indeed, three or four years ago, they tried to kill the opt-out it failed, um, and that was in a Republican-controlled in a Republican-controlled environment where there was a Republican-controlled trifecta, because it was seen as supporting an, a robust lending system. Iowa has the, about the exact amount of credit unions that Minnesota has, despite being about half the population. So there's a a, a good credit system there, and again, um, Iowa borrowers flourished under the Didmica opt-out. Thank you, Attorney General. And as you clear the table, could Dr. Kaiser please come to the table? Ms. Miller, please introduce yourself and proceed. Chair Klein and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to be here. My name is Kim Miller and I am a certified financial counselor with Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota. LSS is a statewide provider of essential services across all 87 counties with more than 2,300 employees who serve one in 63 Minnesotans every year. 
This includes LSS financial counseling, which has over 30 years of experience. I am here in support of SF3932. I have seen the first hand impacts of out-of-state lenders evading Minnesota law through the rent-to-bank loophole. One client had a $3,000 online loan issued by a bank in Utah. The monthly payment of $183 seemed high but manageable. However, after 39 months of payment, the total amount paid was $7,000. $168. The interest rate was 141%. This client did not realize this was an out-of-state bank because they used a website that showed they did business in Minnesota. In comparison, this loan would have been capped at 21% under Minnesota law. Many people look for debt consolidation options online. LSS Financial Counseling can directly help people manage their credit card debt through a debt management plan, or DMP for short. On a DMP, borrowers pay one affordable monthly payment through LSS, and we pay the creditors directly. In return, most creditors reduce interest rates from 0 to 12% and may stop late and over limit fees too. Payoff time is reduced to three to five years with the DMP, and the on-time payments are reported to the credit bureaus. This helps rebuild credit, save thousands of dollars in interest, and pays off the debt in full. rent to bank loans do not accept DMP payments and keep Minnesotans in a revolving debt trap, which can lead to undue hardship and a destabilization of their financial situation. SF3932 builds on previous successful work that has significantly reduced predatory lending practices in Minnesota and would protect Minnesotans even further. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Miller. And as you clear the table, could Phil Goldfeeder come forward? Uh, Dr. Kaiser, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to testify in opposition to Senate File 3932. I'm Dr. Kent Kaiser, Secretary Treasurer of the Domestic Policy Caucus. It is a unanimous 1978 U.S. Supreme Court decision governing federally chartered banks and the 1980 law signed by President Carter called IDMCA governing state chartered banks that established the bank's right to compete across state lines. The result has been vibrant competition among the banks to provide more and more attractive terms on credit and to provide more credit options as well as to provide credit to more and more people. Understand, 32% of consumers have non-prime credit scores. That's 1.8 million Minnesotans. 20% of Minnesotans have difficulty paying ordinary household expenses. These are among the consumers who would be most harmed by Senate File 3932. At first, several states exercised Didmica's opt-out provision. Over time, however, all but Iowa and Puerto Rico rescinded their opt-out laws after realizing the harm to consumers. Iowa is, in fact, practically the definition of a credit desert. Uh, it, a recent study shows that only 0.16% of Iowans have obtained small dollar loans while neighboring uh, consumer friendly Missouri, the number is more than 30 times greater. And understand too, the need for credit doesn't disappear when credit options are taken away. And not everyone can go and sell their plasma as one Exodus lending publication suggests. In Illinois, the state restricted some small dollar credit options averaging, or if an average consumer debt actually increased as consumers with small dollar needs were forced to take out higher dollar loans. What happens when you give people more money? Well, it's human nature. They spend it and thus wind up with greater debt burden for a longer time. Finally, it should be noted that the largest federally chartered banks in the nation are charging the highest fees, and they'd be exempt from Minnesota Senate File 3932 because they would continue to be governed by the Supreme Court's 1978 ruling. At the same time, Senate File 3932 would harm the smaller state chartered banks that offer individualized credit options that we should all want to be the solution for Minnesotans in need. Please oppose Senate File 3932. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. And as you clear, could Hilberto Soria Mendoza from Upstart come forward? Uh, Mr. Goldfeeder, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Chair Klein, Vice Chair Seberger, and members of the Senate Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection for providing me the opportunity to testify before you. My name is Phil Goldfeder. I served as a senior advisor to Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, and I'm a former state legislator from the state of New York. I now continue my public service as the CEO of the American FinTech Council. As CEO of a standards-based trade association representing responsible fintech companies of all sizes and their innovative community bank partners, I recognize that not all bank fintech partnerships are created equal and not all fintech is created equal. While AFC, while AFC members do not offer loans above 36% interest, other bank fintech partnerships do not hold themselves to such a standard. 
In recognition of that, AFC agrees with the bill's intent of creating proper guardrails to ensure Minnesota consumers are protected from high interest lenders operating outside the state's regulatory perimeter. However, this bill is a blunt legislative tool uh, to solve an issue that requires a significant amount of nuance. SF3932 diminishes access for Minnesotans. Under the current law, state chartered community banks are able to partner with fintech companies to offer much needed safe and affordable credit to consumers. This bill opts Minnesota out of the federal law that enables community banks to compete with national banks. As a result, this will significantly decrease the supply of affordable credit in Minnesota at a time when, according to the CFPB, a credit card interest rates are at an all-time high and being driven by a lack of competition. Consumers deserve options in financial services to choose the most appropriate financial product that best serves their needs. Further, high-cost lenders will seek loopholes, like partnering, as it was just said, with nationally chartered banks who are not going to be impacted by this bill's provision and are not beholden to Minnesota state laws. This bill is going to prohibit community banks from, from, from competing. To believe that demand for financial access will simply subside or that in-state banks or organizations will be able to somehow meet the needs and serve consumers pre previously served by out-of-state banks is simply incorrect. What will happen is consumers, once responsibly served through bank fintech partnerships, will now either have no option for credit or be forced to engage with high-interest predatory lenders or nationally chartered banks that are un unfortunately not beholden to Minnesota's rate caps. If passed, SF3932 will decrease access to responsible credit, put community banks, Minnesota community banks, at a disadvantage, and leave Minnesota communities, particularly those in minority and rural communities, with no options but to rely on far too many predatory and high interest lenders. Therefore, we respectfully request that this committee table this bill to consider the, the true nuance needed to properly solve the issues discussed and not harm hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans being responsibly served today by AFC members. I thank you again for the opportunity and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Mr. Goldfeder. And as you clear, could uh, Nicole Dogwell please come to the table? Uh, Mr. Soria Mendoza, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Senator Gustafson, and members. My name is Gilberto Soria Mendoza, representing Upstart in opposition to Senate File 3932. Upstart hosts an online lending marketplace connecting Minnesota consumers to over 100 banks, credit unions, and minority depository institutions, including local institutions like the Bank of Elk River. All of the loans provided are below 36% APR. <laughs> Upstart uses data and AI tools so that our lending partners qualify applicants with lower incomes and lower credit scores to provide the lowest price available. Since 2020, Upstart has powered more than 46,000 loans in Minnesota, equating to $462 million. The average loan by those negatively impacted by this bill on our marketplace is only $8,000. Again, the average loan by those negatively impacted by this bill on our marketplace is only $8,000. Again, all of these are below 36% APR. This is credit that's helped Minnesotans consolidate and pay off their expensive debts and deal with emergencies. The Dedinka opt-out of this bill should concern everyone. Based on our 2022 volumes, we estimate that over 9,000 loans and $68 million in credit will disappear if this bill passes. For example, someone who isn't able to pay off their $10,000 in credit card debt at 30% APR, they come to Upstart and get a loan at 23% APR to pay it off immediately and benefit from the lower interest rate. Their credit score goes up. Further, Minnesotans who've accessed loans between 21.75 and 36% have an average FICO score of 646 and an average annual income of $64,000. These Minnesotans include people of color, renters, people in rural areas, and others who have lower incomes and credit scores, leaving them with fewer credit options. Certain Minnesotans cannot access loans from local lenders due to their low credit score, lower incomes, and other credit factors. Therefore, they seek capital from out-of-state lenders who are willing to provide them with options. Because of Minnesota's very low rate cap on larger consumer loans, this bill will make it impossible for out-of-state community banks to offer affordable loans to consumers, particularly those in minority and rural communities. We look forward to working with you on constructive policy alternatives. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. And as you clear the table, can Danielle Arlo please come forward? Ms. Dogwell, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, thank you for your time today. Uh, my name is Nicole Dogwell. I'm a local attorney here in Minneapolis, and I'm a former chief legal officer of a lending entity. 
I'm now in private practice representing financial institutions, and I'm here on behalf of the Online Lenders Alliance. Um, I will, we've submitted a letter, and I won't repeat the, the prior testimony, but I did want to hone in on one, I think, very key point that I think is very important to consider before you pass this bill. We have significant concern of the unintended consequences of this bill. It's a consumer protection bill, but I think it has to be very careful because I think the consumers you're trying to protect may be hurt by this bill. Our experience is that consumers that take out these smaller loans are typically unbanked, underbanked, or credit constrained. In Minnesota, 10% of consumers are either unbanked or underbanked, and 28% are credit constrained. This is primarily consists of uh, single female households, so single moms and minorities. We just feel that this bill restricts access and limits choice for these consumers, and that's the biggest concern, because this bill may be meant to protect these consumers, but if they don't have access or a choice, doesn't mean their needs are going away. I, our position primarily is that we think this bill warrants further scrutiny and study. Um, I think that Colorado, as people have talked about, have passed this bill, uh, but they haven't implemented it because they're still evaluating how it's going to impact Coloradans. I think the same has to be done here before any kind of um, bill is passed that may end up injuring the people you're trying to protect. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Dogwell. Our final testifier is Danielle Arlo. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Danielle Fagri Arlo, Senior Vice President of the American Financial Services Association. Our association is more than 100 years old. We represent the consumer credit industry, including vehicle finance, mortgages, traditional installment lending, and credit cards. Our members include everyone from small creditors operating in a couple states to some of the world's largest banks. We do not represent payday lenders, we don't represent title lenders, and we don't represent credit unions. I cannot overstate how concerned we are about SF 3932. Here's why. Opting out of Didmica has consequences for our members that have nothing to do with anything that's been discussed so far today. We have a number of members who don't partner with anybody. They don't rent out their charters to anyone. For example, a very large credit card company, some, I'm sure that there are lots of people in the room with their credit cards in their wallet, uh, from the outside looks just like a national bank. But in fact, it's a state charter bank that was formed after Didmico was passed in 1980 and operates just like a national bank because they're able to export their rates and fees just like a national bank does across the country and very competitively at very low rates. Another one of our members that looks just like a captive vehicle finance company from the outside is actually a state charter bank. Another one of our members is a captive vehicle finance company that is licensed by state as a non-bank, but they also have a bank um, as a liquidity option and as a financing option for vehicle floor planning, which is also known as extending credit to automobile dealers uh, to finance the cars in their showrooms that are on their lots or on their lots. Or funding consumer vehicle purchases for different brand names than their own. So they could finance, you know, if they're Acme finance company selling Acme cars, they can finance beta cars, but they aren't do it under their own named financial institution, they do it under their bank. State opt-outs of Dimica pre prevent an existential threat to these members of ours. Again, this has nothing to do with renting a charter. After Dimica passed in 1980, seven states opted in pretty much right away, including Iowa. By 1998, every single state that opted in, opted out, except that it opted out of, of Didmica, opted back in, except for Iowa. Why? Were these states cons protecting their consumers too much? Were they being too good um, to, to what their consumer, were they offering too many choices to their consumers? Or did it turn out that Didmica hurt their own state's banks and their own state's consumers more than it helped them, as it was intended to do. Iowa is a great state. I'm not gonna say anything bad about Iowa, but so, although I mean, I think, I think Minnesota's a little bit better, but <laughs> Minnesotan. But so are Massachusetts and Maine and Wisconsin and Nebraska. Shouldn't we know why every other state that opted out, opted back in before we go down this path? They, they, because they quickly reverse course. And you don't have to believe me. Ask any outside counsel at any law firm in the country who deals with these matters if right now today, if someone comes to them seeking a bank charter, if they will recommend them seeking a state charter bank. The answer is no, not one of them. Because just one state 
being the first state after 40 years to opt back out of Dimica, Colorado, which doesn't even go into effect until later this year, that has destabilized the market enough that it is too risky to recommend a new state bank charter. Our concerns are national in scope, but I'm a Minnesotan. I really would hate to see Minnesota get this wrong. Um, to quote uh, Taylor Swift, you need to calm down. So I try to use that from the other. Um, please shelve this bill at least until Colorado's law has gone into effect later this year. And we've had some time to study it. Uh, the study that, um, respectfully, the study that the deputy AG mentioned um, doesn't have anything to do with Didmica, doesn't mention Didmica. We've seen no studies um, on this on this bill, I mean, I'm sorry, on Dinmica ever. Um, and we only have one state, as we mentioned, that still is using it. In your, in your um, handout materials, there's a timeline of when people opted and adopted out of Dinmica. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Arlo. Uh, members, the intention of the committee is to lay this bill over. Um, as we go to member questions, uh, can I ask the Deputy Attorney General and Mr. Ron Elwood to come to the table just to assist with responses? Um, any member questions? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question for the bill author is, you know, today we have Minnesota consumers who are utilizing the products that we've talked about and that would be um, potentially banned uh, if this bill were to go to effect. And so my, my question, Mr. Chair, for the bill author is, where will those consumers go for uh, potential credit needs that, that they might have that they're currently receiving through some of the providers we've talked about today? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen. So the lending practices of Minnesota stay the same. This is not, people are still able to have money lended to them, they're able to borrow money. We're just asking that anybody who wants to lend money here in Minnesota play by Minnesota rules. And, and that's, that's really at the end of the day, is just making sure that we are following the rules of the consumer protection laws that we have in Minnesota, which are some of the best in the country, and they have to follow those rules. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Augustus. And I guess my, my question is, um, you know, if, if we have a Minnesota consumer today who maybe because of their credit score or some other factor um, is getting one of these uh, consumer finance products and now with this bill being adopted that that product or that um, credit is now unavailable to them, where, where do you anticipate them going to get the credit access that they need? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will rely on my testifiers for more technical questions, but I will just say that you know we've heard testimony that this is not going to limit all lending options. There are still lending options that are available, but if you're taking out an $8,000 loan and then you're paying this enormous amount in interest rate back, then that is going to hurt you in the long run. And we heard lots of people talk about how this is supposed to be helping those who are in uh, communities that are traditionally underserved or marginalized, when in fact those are the exact term, or those that's the exact target, because they feel they can make more money off of those people. That's why we call it predatory lending. Um, and so there are other ways that you can borrow money. Um, I'll probably rely on my testifier to explain a little bit more about what banking practices are still available to Minnesotans, but it, what we're really trying to get at is that people aren't borrowing more money than they're able to pay back, and we certainly don't want to put people in a worse financial state than they're already in. So I'll just say, they couldn't get those triple digit interest General. rate loans, which I don't think help them. I think are that concrete life preserver. They look like they're going to help them, and they sink the person into further debt and get them in debt traps where they roll over and refi and refi. Um, what they will be able to do is still find those mid-rate mid loans that we've heard about. Like I was said in my initial testimony, they can get small dollar loans from Minnesota-based companies or companies that have gotten a Minnesota regulated lender license for up to 50%. And then anything over that small dollar lending loan license um, or threshold is a blended rate of 33%. So I think they would turn to those local products. In Iowa, you saw them getting credit from those regulated lenders, from some of the very fintech uh, that fintech folks who were represented and testifying today who got the Iowa regulated license and then were subject to Iowa regulation. Um, and also, like, credit unions in Iowa had robust small dollar lending programs, and as did the state banks. So. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, my, my concern with this is, you know, I, I, I think consumers are, are smart, and if they could find a product that was less expensive for them uh, through other providers through the state of Minnesota, that they would be doing that. And... Um, you know, this is a robust competitive marketplace, 
Um, and I worry that what this is going to mean is that Minnesotans who today have access to credit, credit will no longer have access. And one question I had, Mr. Chair, for the bill author is, you know, there was an example that was brought up by Upstart today where they talked about um, consolidating and refinancing credit card debt. And it's, it's my understanding from that testimony that this bill, if you had a Minnesota consumer who was paying a higher interest rate on their credit card but was able to find a lower interest rate to refinance that credit card debt, perhaps consolidate that credit card debt, saving them interest payments, that this bill would uh, potentially prohibit that. And my, my question is, why would we do something like that where um, if someone could save on their interest rate that we would prohibit them from doing so? Senator Gustafson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Rasmussen. First, I'll just say that the, the, even the people who testified in opposition of this bill, the first thing they said was that the goal of their banks is to drive competition. So that's their number one goal. And they're going to use Minnesotans to try to increase their own bottom line. They're going to make it look like they're getting a deal, when in fact they're not getting a deal. What they are is getting pushed into something that is long-term going to be financially harmful to them and will put them in further financial trouble than, again, they're already in. Um, to answer your second question, I would probably rely on uh, my testifier, Mr. Elwood, if that is all right with the chair. Mr. Elwood. Uh, Mr. Chair uh, and Senator Rasmus and Ron Elwood with Legal Aid, um, it is not true that that would prohibit a, a consolidation loan. There are brick and mortar companies that are reside here um, that would happily do that and uh, do it today. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you to the bill author and the testifiers. I, I guess, you know, to, to cite a, a potential specific example, if we had someone who was paying a 35% interest rate on their credit card and through uh, a, another credit source was able to find uh, a 25% interest rate to consolidate, it's my understanding that this bill would prohibit that consumer from seeking that lower interest rate to consolidate their credit card debt. Mr. Elwood. Well, I, I don't think that, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Rasmussen, I don't think that's true. As I said, there are uh, finance companies here that are regulated under Chapter 56 that lend under Minnesota rates, which are pretty high as a maximum, 21%. Uh, or a blended rate of 33% and 19%, depending on the amounts. Um, and those companies are housed here. They have brick and mortar uh, uh, presence here. They employ Minnesotans here. And they make those loans. And, and I would imagine that their business would increase. And, and it would help. Uh, and, and also credit unions uh, that lend under Minnesota law. They're the, there's a... Um, uh, letter in your packet from the Minnesota Credit Union Network that supports this bill. Um, you, I don't, you didn't see a single Minnesota lender up here uh, say, suggesting that this is not a good bill. So um, I guess that's the answer to that question. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess the, the comment I would make is, um, you know, everyone would like to have lower interest rates um, for credit products. And I guess my concern is, we have Minnesotans today who are using these products who perhaps could not find alternatives if this bill were to pass. And we have examples of situations where people could be saving money on interest rates that will be prohibited. And you know, we talked about the 21.75% uh, cap. Um, we might have some Minnesotans that the local institutions might not be willing to take on the credit risk for those individuals, and they're stuck paying a higher uh, uh, interest rate to their credit card company than what they could find uh, today in the marketplace. So that's my concerns, Mr. Chair, with the bill. Um, it's just that we're going to restrict access to credit for Minnesotans and potentially restrict them from saving money. Senator Dames. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I've been around now for 14 years, and this bill, a bill similar to this, has been up every year. And Mr. Elwood, you and I have had many conversations over the years on this issue. But what I find interesting is last year we had a bill up and there were people testifying stating that there were all kinds of institutions that would be good players in this and they'd be willing to play in the market. We had to get rid of predatory lending. So that goes on, that, that hearing goes on. Within one or two committee meetings after that, 
The whole atmosphere, the whole, the whole atmosphere changes. No longer were there all these banks and stuff out there that were willing to do this, like we were told when we heard the original bill. So then what we did is we put $500,000 into Exodus so that they could make this work. So I find it kind of interesting, and again today here we are talking about these same things. Yet what we did last year has not changed anything in driving these rates down. And can any one of you three tell me that there are more banks, standard banks, in this market? Did we draw people into the market last year? Uh, do any of the testifiers want to field that? You Ms. you have Deputy Attorney General. You have a. I, I don't think there's been a, a study commissioned on sort of the Minnesota credit atmosphere post that the enactment of that and post it going into effect. I, what this bill gets at is that there is is this loophole to try and close that atmosphere so you can give it a fair test and to see what what other lenders come up. And I, I will tell you again in Iowa with a slightly more closed atmosphere, you had not necessarily banks at the 21%, but these other finance companies we're talking about, regulated lenders, Minnesota and Iowa, that lend in that middle range. And you had more space there and you had more brick and mortar buildings come up and, and smaller local institutions as well as nationwide fin, fin com, financial companies um, base themselves there. So. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Yep. So, uh, Deputy Attorney General, do you, can you answer, or can you tell me what your thoughts are? If predatory lending goes away, do you think we're going to get smaller banks participating in this at lower interest rates? And if you do, why did it not happen last year? Deputy I don't know if you'll get banks. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't see state banks filling this niche very much. You see state credit unions doing it. And in Iowa, when I saw the numbers that Iowa had the same amount of state credit unions as Minnesota, despite half the population, to me that was very telling. The Minnesota credit or the Iowa credit unions were very active in this space. As those, there, there was some high interest loopholes closed in Iowa over my my tenure, and, and they became more active. It, it, it is our dream that that they become more active. I, I will also tell you, I don't necessarily believe that the triple digit interest rate having it available is a good thing because I've seen too many borrowers in distress, and I've seen it harm too many people. And I don't know that just because the credit's there, that's a signal of, of financial help. Senator Dean. Follow up, Mr. Chair. So last year, we made some changes, and it didn't bring any new players into the marketplace. So no matter how you cut it, we dried up some credit for some people. So my question is, what do we want to accomplish here? How much pain and anguish do we want to call, cause in order to get a problem resolution to a problem? If you're going to take all of these predatory lenders out, and I don't like predatory lenders, but if we're going to take them out, there are certain people that need to have that access for funding. And without it, what are going to happen to those people? And Mr. Elwood, you and I have had this conversation many times, and at one point you made the, some... Uh, I'll, I'll say a comment close to this, was, well, maybe, maybe we, if we get the predatory lenders out, maybe these folks won't be able to continue to borrow money because they won't have access to it. But you know, if you have bills to pay and things like that, you have to have access to some funding. So I, I get concerned when we uh, come along with bills like this that aren't going to fix the problem, in my opinion, did not fix the problem last year, and so the talk about bringing banks in, we turned around then and put a half a million dollars into one institution in order to try to solve this. Is that the direction we're going to go again this year? Mr. Ellett. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, um, first of all, I think we have to focus on the fact that what last year's bill was focused on loans that were for two weeks long. This is... These are for lenders that are lending, it's a, they're, they're installment loans, they're different, different, it's a different product. So that's number one, they're two different customers uh, bases. And I think the, the point is being lost that what this is really about is a bunch of folks who don't have presence here from, that are renting essentially a, a, a license, a, a lending license from another state and evading Minnesota's laws. That's what this is really about. Why should 
Minnesota's lenders who are here, who register here at the Department of Commerce, who are licensed lenders, who follow Minnesota laws, be placed at a competitive disadvantage from folks who are online platforms who rent a license from another bank, from another state, and feel that they can evade Minnesota's laws. You have set interest rates here. It's, it's, a, it's a statutory rate. And what this is really about is making sure that folks can't come out, come in here from elsewhere and evade the laws that you have set, that you have determined are appropriate for Minnesota borrowers. That's what this bill is really about. And Mr. Elwood, can I make you, have you make room briefly for uh, Mr. John Kelly from the Department of Commerce who has some? Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a follow-up for Mr. Elwood. Yeah, I'm sorry. Why don't you come on back, Mr. Elwood and uh, <laughs> Senator, Senator Dames. So again, do you feel doing this, do you feel it's not going to dry up some of the credit for some of these folks? Mr. Elwood. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that? Yes, uh, I sure will. So by changing the bill, changing it the way you'd like to change it today, are you saying that do you believe that that's not going to dry up credit for some of these folks that are borrowing the money? Whether it's a two week or a, whatever it is, do you say that will not dry up credit for some of these folks? We'll go to Mr. Elwood and I, then I think uh, the Department of Commerce has some thoughts as well. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Dames, I think one of the things that we lose sight of is the premise that all ac access to all kinds of credit is equal, and it is not. No. Access to predatory credit is bad credit. It is bad for people. It drives, it, it, it drives people into financial distress, and it's worse. And the reality is, in places that have set these rules and that have passed these laws, the world hasn't, the sky hasn't fallen. People always find a way to, uh, to take care of their financial needs, but in a more responsible and a less financially harmful way. Mr. Thank Kelly. you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Dames. Mr. Kelly. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, John Kelly, Director of Government Affairs for the Department of Commerce. Um, so the department is neutral on, on this bill, but we, there were questions relating to the lending environment in Minnesota, and we thought we would shed a little bit of light. So we believe the opt-out uh, would result in non-Minnesota state charter banks and credit unions from making loans to residents at the, in those institutions' home state rates. We would have no known impact to Minnesota state chartered banks or credit unions. Minnesota state charter credit union, banks or credit unions within opt-out states as Iowa still actively lend to Minnesotans. The opt-out could reduce Minnesotans' access to loans. I don't think anybody's disputing that in this hearing. I think what we're saying, what we see is we have a diverse and deep financial institution profile in Minnesota, and we think any impact would be remediated by our in-state depositories or other non-depository lenders. So we're, we're, we're not coming up here to testify in support or opposition or anything. We're neutral, but we, you know, we think that there's, the slack could get picked up by the entities operating in the state. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Senator Duckworth. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. A good old neutral stance of the Commerce Department. Very good. I appreciate it. Well, I'll be honest with you. I've got a couple of questions, but just a couple of comments. But based on everything that's been said so far in this conversation, I can't tell whether Republicans or Democrats think about this bill. Um, maybe that's a good thing. Um, but the, the testimony is all over the place. There's clearly still very significant issues or, or potential implications with the bill. Nobody seems to know exactly how it's going to play out. So I'm, I'm glad, Mr. Chair, you gave clarity right away that it's going to get laid over. Uh, because one of, my, one of my main concerns about this bill is the speed at which the bill has been dropped is being heard in both the House and the Senate and advanced. Uh, I think it, it maybe it got dropped and was advanced uh, to where it could be taken up on the floor in the House. Not that I care so much about what they're doing, but over here, I think we've got to be very careful and leery as it relates to this bill based on the conversation we've had so far. Um, the conversation about placing businesses at a, at a disadvantage compared to other states almost made me jump out of my chair. I mean, we could have a whole lengthy conversation about competitive advantage in the business environment here in our state compared to others, not just in relation to this bill. So I think we want to be very mindful of 
the, uh, the conversation or the arguments we're using as it relates to this bill and compared to the advantages or disadvantages business owners have in general in Minnesota compared to other states, especially our border states. Um, one question I would have for the Deputy Attorney General is this, Mr. Chair, if I may. Um, you, you've mentioned triple digit interest rates uh, on occasion, things of that nature. Does the Attorney General's office have the ability to pursue predatory lenders or those who are doing a practice like that if they deem it to be uh, you know, a, a violation of, of the law or so egregious that it's harming consumers? Attorney General Whitney. So if we're gonna talk about a rent-a-bank situation where it's one of these fintechs with a Utah bank, say, where Utah has no interest rate limits and there are no other, it's just a strict 150% loan for a puppy, for example, mm -hmm. like I'm pulling that from mm -hmm. one of my Iowa cases. Um, we couldn't go after them in Minnesota because there's where's the violation of the law? Because they're export they're free to export that 150% interest rate here. And, and that's the point, I guess. That's the loophole that they get in with. Now, if they were doing something else, and if we think they're hiding the ball or there's some deception, that then we could go after them. But if it's just strict uh, fintech loan partnering with a, 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 a out-of-state bank, no. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for that answer. I appreciate it. Um, I think some of the most compelling testimony we heard came from uh, the testifier that listed off all of the banks, or excuse me, all of the states that had initially done what this bill suggests the state of Minnesota do, but then quickly reversed course after they saw how it played out in their state, except for the state of Iowa, which is, I'm originally from Iowa, so I have no ill will there. Uh, but to me, if that's not uh, compelling, enough reason to, to more closely examine this bill and its potential impact. Uh, I don't know what else uh, there is. Another question I have, um, perhaps for Senator Gustafson or whoever might be the best to answer it is, uh, what is the impact or what would the impact of this bill be on state chartered banks versus nationally chartered banks? And really what I'm asking is, are nationally chartered banks essentially exempt from what this bill is calling for or would it apply to them as well? Senator Gustafson or the testifier. Uh, sure, I'll go. go uh, national banks uh, are, are exempt from this bill, but national banks are not, the regulators don't allow them to enter into these rent-a-bank um, operations. They tried in the early aughts and their regulators said no. So national banks aren't gonna supplant these state banks because they won't, they won't be allowed because it's not considered safe and sound lending by their regulators. And I do wanna correct the point that the states quickly left the field after the opt-out, the, the other six, five states that did. Um, they left in the 90s during a period of deregulation of credit with the upswing of payday loan licensing laws. And I know at least a couple of those states had, have reached out to me about my experience about opting back in, and some of them are proposing legislation to do so. So it wasn't a quick, op I mean, they opted out in 81, and then it was like through the 90s that they, that they killed their opt out. So I just wanted to get clear of that record. Senator Dr. Right. Would it be fair to say they have not been quick to opt back in? Senator, or Deputy Attorney General. They, uh, Colorado's opted back in, the other states are looking at it. No, no one else has opted back in. Uh, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so I, I'm not quite sure I understand your answer to the question regarding national banks. It sounds to me like they could still continue to do what this bill is trying to prevent, but you're just saying that they, that they likely won't. They, Deputy Attorney General. On a, a, yes, they could, except their regulator won't allow them because their regulator doesn't consider these sort of high interest loans safe and sound because they had done it in the early aughts and it has been prohibited since then. Otherwise, I think they would be there now, honestly, you know, if they could and if it was making them money, why wouldn't they? Because they, they technically, the law allows them to, the regulator does not. Okay. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, if the bill would still allow certain institutions to do what it's trying to prevent, um, I don't necessarily see that as a fix. I understand the nuance you're providing. Um, you know, I, I think we, we've been in a situation many times with a few bills more recently where everybody has said that we have really good intentions regarding the law, and then when it's put into place and plays out, we realize all the second and third order effects weren't what we intended and actually sometimes cause harm to the very people they were trying to help. I think a couple of testifiers said that almost verbatim. Um, and that also causes me pause as it relates to this bill. So I mentioned my concern regarding the speed at which it's moving. I think maybe perhaps that's why some of the people aren't here today to, to provide uh, testimony, whether it's for or against the bill. Um, and for me, what it comes down to is, uh, am I for or against consumers having options? Am I for or against folks who are in dire need 
having the ability to utilize a product like this? Am I for or against the consumer having a choice? And I think that there's more work on the bill that needs to be done in regard to that, or I certainly hope it doesn't move uh, very speedily because I think it's very evident today uh, that there are some very significant issues regarding the bill that still need to be ironed out or some consensus or, or additional compromise needs to occur because when I hear some of the against testimony that I heard today, it really causes me uh, a pause and alarm regarding if this were to become law in the state of Minnesota. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess my question is, is if the state, if you're looking to these state chartered banks to fill that void when they, these other outfits leave, why aren't they playing there now? How come they're not in the mix now? There's nothing preventing them, is there, from them playing in this uh, arena? Uh, Senator Gustafson, or the Attorney General. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Um, as I said in Iowa, what happens is not that necessarily state banks do. Credit unions do step up more. I, I, I mean, I, I will tell you, credit, state credit unions have stepped up. But what happens is it, the, it doesn't get filled necessarily by the state banks, but by other regulated lenders that then have to have a license and a presence in Minnesota. And then that's the charter they get. Like some of these, the actual fintechs themselves and not the banks that are behind them go ahead and get a charter that then gives them skin in the game in the state. So well, I, I guess... Mr. Chair, and, and my comment would be is if there's nothing preventing them from playing in the game now, there's nothing preventing them from doing that licensing and, and, and actually entering the market now. And so if the market is available to them, uh, and I'm a big believer in the market should drive everything, why isn't the market available to them now? And why, if they're available, if they can get in there and, and do that, I don't see why they're not in that game currently. And that's, I guess, my comment. Thank you. Any other member questions or comments? Senator Gustafson, I'm going to let you give some closing comments before we end, but just a couple of comments of my own. Uh, Legislators before us decided that there was something that was safe for Minnesota families, that interest rates above a certain percentage were harmful to individuals and damaging to families. Uh, and that's a law that we passed in the state of Minnesota to protect people from that. All we're asking with Senate File 3932 as amended is to make outstate players play by the same rules that we think are good for Minnesotans. So I appreciate you bringing the bill. If you have any closing comments before we lay it over. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just, it just, it sort of reminds me of, you know, back in during the housing bubble where there were a lot of really good offers to buy a house and everybody was sort of pressured into doing that and a lot of people bought houses that they couldn't afford and they were kind of led one way because that's what it looked like. And it just, it feels icky when people are sort of sold one bill of goods that it's going to be, it's going to be helpful for them only to find themselves in more financial debt and a more, a much more negative place later on. So. I agree. I think you said it best. This is really just asking everybody to play by the rules that Minnesota has in place. We are one of the best states for consumer protection, and we'd like to keep it that way. Member Senate File 3932 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. The committee is adjourned.